Hey gamers, Maniac here, doing another requested podcast. This one was one I promised after my last podcast, and it is going to be really weird for me to be talking about this subject matter, because if I may say, this franchise that we're going to be talking about is the very first franchise I ever played on a modern PC. I am not kidding. When... And you're, I'm gonna, I'll probably tell the story in a bit more detail as we get along with this, but Commander Keen was the, you know, when I got my very first real computer back in, I think it was 1996, late 1996, the first game I ever played on it was Commander Keen Episode 4. That was, the, that was it. And I, I still have fond memories of like, oh, wow, this is what the PC can do. That was my first taste of what would go on to be a very, very long love affair with modern gaming. And for me personally, it all started with Commander Keen. So welcome to this podcast, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maniac, and for those of you who have not heard my podcast before, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a quick little run through. This podcast is an unscripted video, you know, an unscripted uh, audio recording where I try to talk about a very specific video game franchise. And I'll talk about the history of the franchise, my experiences with it, and where I feel that franchise is going to be or what I feel the future holds for that franchise. This is probably not going to be as long as my uh, podcast about Pokemon. <laughs> but it's going to be, this is, this, we're going to be talking about this for quite a while because I've, I know a lot about the history of what went into making this beloved game series, and I'm going to share some of this with you uh, right now, basically. For those of you who don't know, Commander Keen was, uh, at least the story behind it, behind Commander Keen, was written by a man named Tom Hall, who was working for a company called id Software at the time. Now, the history behind id Software is beautifully written in a book called Masters of Doom written by David Kushner, which I do not believe is in print anymore, unfortunately. But if you ever wonder, well, what is the history behind modern PC gaming and id Software in particular, you really need to read that book. It is, I can't, I can't rave about it enough. Any, any um, college course worth their salt that talks about new media or um, a history of video games or something must include that book as part of its curriculum or else, the, as far as I'm concerned, the whole class is pointless. Um, it, is, it is a phenomenal book. I'm getting a bit, I'm getting a bit long-winded about this. I, I, I tend not to do this in podcasts, but I'm getting a bit long-winded, so I basically will just simply state the facts. id Software was a company formed by five men originally working for a company called Softdisk. They were living in, I believe, Shreveport, Louisiana, and during the week they uh, programmed software for Softdisk in the with the intention of basically selling them as like a monthly magazine. Back then, what you would do was you you wouldn't just you could just buy software in the store, but it was very common back in the day because floppy disks were so inexpensive. That you would actually you could actually subscribe to a software uh, subscription service, and as long as you had a subscription, you would basically get a new piece of software in the mail every month. And a lot of companies, you know, at back at the time, this was great because, well, first off, you know, it meant for you know an ongoing staple of of software. Companies would hire people. It didn't take long to release software. Now, a lot of the software, I'll admit, weren't games. It was only occasionally that they would do games. Most of it would be like Abacus software, you know, calculation software, spreadsheets, um, word processors, you know, simple software for, you know, for computers that didn't have too crazy, you know, we're talking about software written for the DOS operating system and stuff like that back in the day or the Apple II. Nothing super crazy, but you would get a new piece of software every month. There were several people, including, of course, John Carmack, John Romero, Adrian Carmack, Tom Hall, who really, really saw a lot that could be done by the time computers started releasing IBM 386 processors. 
they are, you know, at the time you had, you know, obviously you had computers, you also had game systems, you had, you know, Atari had long since been, you know, had, had, but, but Nintendo was, this was a time when Nintendo was pretty much taking over the world and everybody had a Nintendo Entertainment System or a Famicom, depending upon where they lived. The problem was, was that the Nintendo, while it was based on older technology, could do what the PC couldn't do. It could do smooth side-scrolling, and even the most top-of-the-line PCs at the time, which was, again, the 386, couldn't, couldn't replicate that. You know, they, they just didn't have the processing power to do it. And that was a bit of a shame because a lot of people thought, well, if you could get a computer to replicate that, and, and if you could get a PC to do what you see Mario do, even in the most crudest of basic uh, standards, the PC could become its own platform for, for actual games. But nobody knew if this was even possible. Enter John Carmack and Tom Hall, who late one night, according to the story, they... John Carmack has always been a guy, even to this day, that has pushed, has taken technology and pushed it beyond what it was originally designed to do, or could use technology in a way to bring the best of it out, whichever you prefer to call him. And I guess Carmack had an idea. Carmack had an idea. It's like he took his 386 and he figured, well, I can't make the computer replicate a, you know, a, a smooth side scroller, you know, for, 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 you know, all, as many frames as a second, it just wouldn't be stable. It's not possible on a 386. But what if we took a shortcut? What if instead of basically refreshing the whole screen for every frame, you know, which required, you know, 30 to 60 frames, you know, for 30 to 60 frames a second, what if I, he only changed the pixels that were what were being changed every frame? All the rest of the frames that, that were, or all the rest of the pixels that didn't need to be redrawn simply wouldn't be redrawn. The 3D6 could do that. So Carmack went to work one night with Tom Hall, and, when, and Tom Hall stayed up late, and he saw this technology, and he says, well... If your theory is correct, then we can basically use this technology to replicate Super Mario Brothers 3. And I think that as a, you know, as a test, they decided to basically just simply rebuild the opening scene of Super Mario Brothers 3 on the PC. Super Mario Brothers 3 was the most popular NES title of its time. I remember I had a copy of it. I thought the game was great. It's my, still my favorite Mario game. And yeah... That's a good, that's, if you can replicate, if you could replicate that, then yes, you have a successful test. And one night they stayed up late, you know, Tom looked at, you know, sketched out the, you know, based upon the game system, he sketched out the level, they implemented it, but instead of using Mario, they replaced the Mario sprite with um, a sprite for a character that John Romero had created for one of his games called Dangerous Dave. So... They created this game, this little game. It was just a demo called, and they called it Dangerous Dave in Copyright Infringement. And they saved it on a disc and left it for John Romero to find the next day when he came in. John Romero came when he, they all went to, I guess they left and went to bed. So as the story goes, and Romero confirms, you know, this, he came in the next day, found a disc with instructions on what to load and how to load it put it in his PC, and saw what they had accomplished in one night and said, this is the greatest thing that mankind has ever seen because this is, you know, this is how Romero was back then. You know, this is the coolest thing on planet Earth. We have to take this. We have to take this and we have to, we're not going to make this for soft disk. We're going to take this and we're going to break off and we're going to start our own company and I know just the guy that, you know, to, to, we could try to get this, you know, to distribute this. And lo and behold, uh, Odyssey came out. Now, originally, 
id Software plans to use the technology to basically create a PC port of Super Mario Brothers 3. The intention was to use the computers that they had at work, steal them on weekends, and, um, and basically build most of the game. They figured if they had most of the game working on the PC, then when they finally made the presentation to Nintendo or, sh or shipped it off to Nintendo, Nintendo might be more likely to... Um, to accept it, to, to, to license it. But um, when they sent it to Nintendo, Nintendo at the time, and probably still to this day really, but Nintendo at the time had no interest in licensing their games for any platforms other than their own, uh, especially not the PC. So they, they simply sent a letter of denial. They said, you guys did great, but we're not interested in publishing games on the PC at all. And so that basically was the stop to that. A bit deterred, the guys at id decided, well, we still have the technology. Let's just make our own game with it. They can't stop us from doing that. And so the guys worked on a lake house, I believe, in Shreveport, Louisiana. Again, that's, the, uh, that's, the, that's, how, that's how the story was written. I, I, might have the, I might have the numbers on the years, on, on, the, on the basic framing wrong, but, you know, this is the story where the guys would basically you know, spend time in a beautiful lake house in Shreveport, Louisiana, and they, they'd spend their weekends coding, and then they'd bring the computers back to work every, you know, before the week start, before the weekend ended, and work, and work for others, you know, for their, you know, and work their day jobs, you know, Monday through Friday. Finally, they got a guy, I believe, by the name of Scott Miller, they got a hold of him. Scott Miller had been publishing... Um, games under the under a different type of license. It was called Shareware. And Scott Miller's business plan at the time was just miraculous. He had come up with this idea where basically, like I said, at the time, most software, you could buy software individually at stores and stuff like that, or you could buy them on a subscription model. Again, you got to keep your software, so you know, the subscription model was pretty good for consumers. That's why people bought into it. But um, what his idea was, was to do a new type of business model known as the shareware model. Where, and this was specifically for games. The idea was, was that um, you'd make a game in three parts. And what you would do was you'd release the first part of the game for free. Like the first third of it. But the other two thirds you'd have to pay for. And you'd pay for those individually. You could, you know, if you wanted a, on a bundle deal, you could do that. But for the most part, you pay for those games individually. And it made it, Miller went, you know, went to business, and, and this was this was successful. This was a very successful business model for him, especially given the fact that you know you had BBSs at the time, which would very be very happy with sharing all this, you know, this, the, these shareware software pieces around the internet and, and and the early functions of the internet and FTP servers and stuff like that. So there was a lot going on, you know, in technology that made this business model a very good one. And they figured they could build a game using this software and release it on the shareware model. They could build three episodes of a game, you know, which would require, you know, each one would be several levels. And, it would, and all three episodes would tell a complete story. But they, needed a, but they needed a concept. So Tom Hall decided he was going to create the concept. He was, he, he was the game director of id. And Tom Hall wrote down a story about a, small, a kid with his brother's football helmet who, who built himself a rocket ship and tried to fight aliens. And he ended up on Mars. And that's where the first episode started. And I know what you're probably saying. That is the most ridiculous story concept I have ever heard in my life. And I will tell you, yes, but God, I love it. I, I just, I just, it, it's so simple, but it's just so, it's just so adorable and perfect and endearing. That's all it took. That's all it took. And they called him Commander Keen. And that's how this story starts. Now, I told you that story to tell you this story. There, we're going to go back to talking about id software in just a couple of minutes. But I felt like 
I kind of told you what the baseline was for the history of what began Commander Keen and what basically was his inspirations. So I felt like now is probably the time when I should talk about, well, where do I fit into all of this? And what is my experience with Commander Keen? And I'll, I'll, I'll start with this story right now. Growing up, I never really had a computer. I always was fascinated by computer technology, uh, at probably since I first saw my very first computer when I was in first grade. I was just fascinated by this computer and I wanted to use it so badly. And within probably at a very early age, I actually became one of the proctors for uh, my old, for, for my elementary school's um, computer lab. Uh, when I was, I think it was, I was either eight or nine years old, I can't remember, but I was in uh, second grade, if I remember correctly. They asked me for some reason to be a proctor. They, uh, my school had just implemented and installed a brand new computer lab full of a uh, brand new IBM PC Model 25. Yes, Model 25 IBM, just so you know exactly which one it was. They got a whole slew of them, a, whole, a bunch of software to go with them too. They were all networked. I don't think they had internet access, but they were all networked together so they could talk to each other. Um, and yeah, we had, uh, I was able to figure out very, how to use them very quickly. And so I implemented a, uh, a, a pilot program with, you know, the approval of the principal. In fact, I think it was the principal that, that chose me for that particular position. And um, I demoed uh, software that they had access to and said, okay, we should work on this software. Oh, we should work on this software. Oh, we should work on this software next. And um, proctored it. And it was fun. It was a lot of fun. And um, I didn't even have a computer of my own. I was just able to figure out very quickly how the computers at the school worked and how to use the software and I, you know, with a little bit of practice and, and, and experience, very little, that's all I needed. I, my parents realized very quickly that they should get me a computer. The only problem was, was that computers at the time were very expensive. If you wanted a, a, a decent mid-range, now there, there are reasons why these computers were expensive. I mean, technology was, was very, very slow to start but it was accelerating and doubling and increasing in performance very quickly. Um, this was at a time when, you know, you were having this big megahertz buffer, which doesn't really exist anymore, but you're having this big megahertz war between AMD and Intel. This was in the late 90s, where it was like, I can do 600 megahertz. No, I can do 700 megahertz. No, I can do 800 megahertz. And you were willing to pay for that because there were tangible differences in performance. If you went from like, let's say, you know, 250 megahertz, and then you went to 500 megahertz, you would definitely notice it. You would definitely notice a difference in your applications and loading times, just in starting your operating system, there would be differences. You would, you gladly paid for that speed. And if you bought something, it would probably be able to run the vast majority of the games that you set up for it. That doesn't really happen anymore. If you buy a piece of junk, it's not playing anything. Heck, even some you know low mid-range computers won't play anything these days. But back then, if you bought, even if you bought a mid-range system, the chances were it would at least be able to run many of the games that you wanted to play on them. And in late 1996, my, my dad decided he was finally gonna buy us a computer and he bought a, um, he bought my very first real computer. It was a Intel clone. I think it was a, uh, either, it was either a 46 or a Pentium clone or something like that. It ran at 133 megahertz. And that was, uh, my very first computer. It had 16 megs of RAM, which was enough. It was running Windows 95, which was enough. And um, we were we got a bunch of software with it. And one of the uh, as I'm learning this computer, I never used Windows 95 before, but I learned it very quickly. In fact, a lot of the shortcuts and stuff that I learned in Windows 95 are actually still applicable even to this day for Windows 10. 
So don't be forgetting those shortcuts or key commands, or even from the early Windows days, because they're still around. They didn't remove them. Like I remember learning. Well, what if you want to go to the system menu for you know to, to get the system you know the system menu? Oh, just hold down Alt and double click on the My Computer application, and it will automatically pick up you know pull up the system uh, in the control panel or the the system dialog box. I checked that in Windows 10. It's still it's still there. So yeah, it was good that I learned Windows 95 back in the day. And of course there have been improvements and stuff like that, but that's not, you know, neither here nor there. This is just where I, you know, I was getting this started. We got some software with the computer. I mean, my dad paid a pretty penny for it. I can't remember if he paid two grand for it or two and a half grand. It was expensive even at the time for that kind of system. But like I said, for what we got and for how long it lasted us, we were pretty happy with it. And, um... So I pick up this system, and I go through a series of disks that are included along with the package. They didn't put any shovelware on computers back, at least not the one I, I bought. There was no shovelware on it, or anything like that. But um, they did include, you know, CD-ROM disks for a lot of cool stuff. You know, trial software, main software, stuff like that. And uh, one of the disks that was included with the system was a disk called, uh, I think it was like 99 or 100... Uh, you know, free games. And of course I wanted to try that out. And in the uh, disk were basically folders for pretty much every shareware game that you could possibly imagine. Now I mentioned in the last section when I was talking about the history of id software, what shareware was, the shareware business model. It kind of stopped around the days of when, when Quake came out, Shareware, I think that was like the last major Shareware game. That was 96, 97 or so. But before then, most major games uh, were released through the Shareware business model. And since I got my first computer in 1996, that meant that there was a long list of games that had come out by that point that I could certainly play. Um, I had access to the sharewares for Wolfenstein 3D, for example. I had access to the shareware for uh, the original Doom. I had access to the shareware for games like uh, Terminal Velocity and stuff like that. A lot of, you know, some, some many, many of the Apogee software games and 3D Realms games and stuff like that. As well as the id software uh, catalog of shareware as well. There was a bunch of shovelware in there, but for the most part, I mean... I would find myself playing and enjoying a lot of um, a lot of those games. Now, they were organized in folders. I'm pretty certain there was like some kind of main menu or something for that particular, you know, for that game, for that disc. But you could just simply open up the disc, you know, locate, you know, the disc itself and go through the folders and pretty much everything was labeled. And you could access the game, you know, the sharewares manually or copy them or whatever you wanted. And one of the uh, folders that caught my eye when I was looking at the, uh, the list of folders for, for demos and stuff like that that were on the disk was a folder called Keen. It just caught my eye. I don't know why. So I double-clicked on the folder, and I, I, it turned out I pulled up a game called Commander Keen Episode 4. Now, I haven't talked about the second uh, Commander Keen series just yet because I just wanted to talk about, well... What was, the fir what was my first experience before I kind of started to talk about, well, the, there was a second, there, there was a bit more to the Commander Keen series than id software, than just that, than what I've already said about id software. And I kind of want to tell that second story right now, actually. Commander Keen um, was an unquestionable success. The first trilogy for Commander Keen games, even though... Uh, id Software had given away the first episode of Commander Keen, Marooned on Mars, I believe it was called, for free. Sales of the second and third episodes were pretty much through the roof. Immediately once id Software started getting the war their uh, cut from sales from Scott Miller's uh, team, from Scott Miller's publishing company, it realized, well, there's no reason for us to be working at Softdisk anymore. We're gone. We're, we're starting our own company. We're in software now. We, we are gone. And they left. 
I won't go into, you know, how amical the break was between soft disk, you know, between id software and soft disk, or, or I, I won't go into any of that. Like I said, if you really want to hear about that, then you can read Masters of Doom. But the immediate plan was, was to make a sequel to Commander Keen. Uh, because they had seen the success of Commander Keen and they figured the technology was such that they could improve it. Now, in the interim, before making the second Commander Keen trilogy, I think they had to make a, a kind of like a transitional game called Keen Dreams. And it was, ha I think, I think if, if I remember correctly, it had to be given to Soft Disk as like one of the games that um, basically I think I think the team from id Software still owed, still owed Soft Disk a couple of games. Now Scott Miller's team had also had had provided some software to Soft Disk on behalf of id Software that that you know that Apogee themselves had worked on to kind of fit you know to kind of meet those terms. But one, but but Softest did get a keen a keen game called Keen Dreams. Now Keen Dreams, in a lot of cases, they don't people most people don't consider this a a a, a member of the Keen trilogy or, or of the Keen series at all, even though John Carmack himself had worked on it and had developed a a, a new type of you know improvements to the site, used it as a game to you know to talk about improvements to a side scrolling engine. Um, but uh, yeah, I haven't played Keen Dreams, so I can't really comment it that much. I have seen Keen Dreams. I didn't like it very much. You know, I, I think I played like a little bit of it, but I, I didn't find myself liking it very much. So I, I didn't really play it that much. I certainly don't think I played through it. But you could see that there were a lot of genuine graphical improvements there between that game and the first Commander Keen trilogy. But what... Id Software was planning for the second Commander Keen trilogy was phenomenally amazing. The graphics were incredibly improved. The it, it looked so much better. It looked like a Nintendo game. It looked so much better than the first trilogy. The art style was gloriously awesome. And I think that probably... Um, Tom Hall's, you know, initial designs and stuff like that were probably a big part of that. As well as Adrian Carmack, it, it, it can be, you know, can be given credit for uh, the, the, the amazing art style. But um, it was just so gloriously fun looking. When I first laid my eyes on Commander Keen Episode 4, I knew this was a game that I, not only did I know that this was a game that I had to play, was that I knew at that moment I was done with consoles. I knew that I would be a PC gamer from then on. And I was happy with being a PC gamer from then on. Uh, at least until, you know, I had my big PC falling out in the late 2000s. Which we, you know, pro I may say, at brief, I may touch upon briefly later on. But yeah, um... Id Software, once again, was planning on doing a shareware business model, but they were also looking into retail business as well. The reason why was because if you wanted to buy a Commander Keen game, you basically had to find the original software, the original shareware episode on some BBS somewhere. This was really before online you know, websites were, were a thing. Then there was uh, other issue, you know, then there were other issues with, you know, you had to call up, you know, Apogee, later 3D Realms, and pay for copies to be shipped over to you. You couldn't simply just go to a store and buy it. Enter a guy named Mark Rain. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, wait, I know Mark Rain. Are you talking about the guy who works for Unreal? Um, works for the Unreal developers? Um, the, the guy at Epic? Yeah, that Mark Rain. That's right. Before Mark Rain worked for, you know, got a solid job at uh, Epic Mega Games, later of course just Epic, I guess, Epic Games. He um, he he was a interim vice president for id Software, and he cut a deal to um, the release the uh, Commander Keen Episode Six for um, at, at retail for retail channels. And uh, they thought that was a really good idea 
But Scott Miller did not. Scott Miller thought, no, that really is not a good idea because what's going to happen is, is that you're not going to make as much money on the shareware business model if you're only releasing one episode as opposed to two. You're going to release a whole episode for free, yes, but you could make more money theoretically. Basically what's happening is you're, going to, you're splitting the trilogy between both a retail channel and a, um, a, digital, a, a digital one. It's not going to. It's not going to be as profitable as the first episode, as as the first trilogy was, and um, there is there is a bit of understanding to that. I, as far as I know, from the numbers that I saw, uh, there were two issues with id releasing uh, episode six at retail as opposed to through the shareware business model. One was, and in hindsight, this is the big one. It took forever. For um, it took forever for episode six to end up getting bundled with the rest of the Commander Keen games. Almost immediately after, you know, 3D Realms and, and Apogee was taking off, they had their own website. For the longest time ever, they were they were developing and re, and selling Commander Keen's episodes, the id software Commander Keen episodes, on their website. No problem. You could, you could. Get, I, I know that they were releasing it on a. They, they had it on a disc, but I'm pretty certain they were also releasing it on their website through digital. Later on, you could, you could buy it and download it legitimately. But they couldn't include episode six or Keen Dreams with that bundle. It was only episodes one through five. And anyone who's played the second Commander Keen trilogy knows that they really episodes four, five, and six should be considered to be a complete story. So that was a bit of a problem. I think that's since been resolved. Uh, my guess is contracts might have expired or aggressive renegotiations have, have, have continued or have concluded because I'm pretty certain you can get all of the, uh, the Commander Keen episodes through one distribution channel or another, whether it be Steam or something else. But uh, yeah, so I think that's now been resolved. But for the longest time, that was a bit of it. That was an issue. So, I'm going to get back to now, now that I've told that story, I'm going to go back to what my experiences were playing Commander Keen. I loved every second of it. I mean, when I, grew, when I was growing up, I kind of considered myself a bit of a boy genius. I can understand technology from a very early age. You know, not to, not to pat myself on the back, but <laughs> I used to joke that, you know, I, I used to make the jokes I was probably smarter than my teachers and stuff like that, you know. But some of that in hindsight, maybe that was just, you know, bragging or, you know, but like I was, I was 10, I was 11, I was 12. I was miserable at school at that point. I, I had let, the elementary school, I said, where I let me proctor the computer lab. I, I let, I, I, my parents moved to my detriment and um, I, I ended up going into another school by force. I, I ended up being forced into going to another school, which I absolutely hated. And I was stuck in that school system for quite a many amount of years. And I have absolutely no positive stories whatsoever to say about that school system. So that just tells you, for the amount of years that I was in there, how bad that must have been for me. So you, you could tell basically why I found a lot to like with Commander Keen and the story behind it. I empathized with him and I loved the graphics and gameplay. However, I was broke. I had nothing to play of Commander Keen, and it was way many years past. Uh, obviously, by this point, id Software had already been, you know, developed Wolfenstein and Doom and Quake and Quake 2. So, I mean, it was obvious that if I was going to get Commander Keen, it, I was going to, you know, obviously get it through legitimate means, but that was going to require money and alternate channels. Like, um, I guess, uh, 3D Realms' website or something like that. I simply didn't have the access or the money to, uh, to, to get it when I first started playing the Sharewares. But I played the hell out of, uh, I remember playing the hell out of Commander Keen Episode 4 and just loving every second of it. Fast forward a couple of years. Um, I, I, mem I mentioned earlier, just a couple of seconds ago, that I didn't have very good uh, school experience. I also didn't have very good summer experiences either. I very rarely had a summer where I was simply just allowed to sit on the couch and watch TV all day. Um, most of my uh, summers were spent either working or studying. 
I, I mean, don't get me wrong, I still would have some time off, but um, I'd always be doing pointless, you know, I'd either be doing pointless physical activities like playing baseball or hockey or I'd be uh, doing a day camp or something like that. Or later on, I started working as a tutor and as a, as, you know, I, ver I, didn't, I didn't exactly ha very often have a summer where I could simply, I could simply just hang out, use the computer and um, watch TV. That, that didn't really happen to me that much. To say nothing of the fact that summers don't last as long as they used to. <laughs> I mean, it just seems like, especially nowadays, summers just last from like the, it used to be you'd get mid-June, all of July, and all of uh, August, and then you'd be, you know, back in school early, very early September. Uh, these days, I mean, you kids have it really bad, I'm sure, nowadays, because I've looked at, you know, recent schedules, and you're like, you pretty much lose all of June. You're, you're pretty much spending all of June in school. You get July, and you're back before the end of August. Like, some people may actually be back in school by this point when I'm recording this, or by the time I post this. So, yeah, that's, you know, that's really unfortunate. But, um... So I, I remember spending a summer working at UConn one, one summer, and I had, ma I had made some money, and I had only had about maybe four or so weeks, give or take. I had spent most of the summer, you know, studying and working and tutoring and, and, and um, taking classes and stuff like that. So, I, and it was just was through accelerated programs and stuff, so I just did not have free time. I wasn't able to check the news. I wasn't. I, I usually like to keep, even when I was in high school, I like to keep up to date with what was going on in the gaming industry at the time. That just wasn't possible while I was working. I was working like straight five days a week, and even my weekends I was were, were very short. So I didn't have much time to basically catch up on everything I lost during the week or, or missed during the week, I should say. But once the program was over, I had about a, a buffer of about four or so weeks, give or take. I can't remember which summer this was. Don't quote me on this. Where I could simply catch up on everything that I had missed. And I decided that I was going to spend that summer playing Commander Keen finally. I had the money. I picked up the games. I, downloaded the, I, I, I purchased the games as digital downloads. And I started playing them. Starting at episode one, I did not play Keen, Keen Dreams, I mentioned before, Keen Dreams was not part of the package, all the way up till episode five. And um, I said to myself, I'm finally going to finally be able to play these, these great, great, great games that I missed out on. At this point, I had a newer computer, which ran it just, you know, the games were designed to be running on old DOS. Uh, I think it was, what, 386s or maybe 486s or something. So, you know, it's CGA graphics. I, I think at that point I was probably using a penny, uh, a, an Intel 500 megahertz with, a, with at least a, a, crew, a crude 3D graphics board with 64 gigs of RAM, at least. So, yeah, I think I was, I think I was good. So I started. I, st I finally spent a summer playing Commander Keen. From beginning to end, I remember just having such a blast. It was, I, this is I would stay up late. I would play at night. I would stay up late. I go from level to level. I keep my progress saved. And when I beat one game, I just immediately move on to the next one and move on to the next one. And you could just tell that as I was, you know, it, it was like a snapshot in the air, you know, when I was looking at id software, because I know that id developed these, these episodes chronologically, and you could just tell the levels and the games were getting better and better. Each, each, each episode I played was better than the last. Some were more challenging than others. I mean, I think probably episode three was probably tougher than episode four, but episode four was pretty tough, even. It took me a long time for my, you know, younger self to get through it, but eventually I did. And episode five was even tougher than episode four. But I, again, I was able to get through it okay. So you, you had to map the levels out in your mind. You had to use your tools to your advantage. You know, I wouldn't get every secret. I was just trying to basically be able to make it through. I loved the dope fish. I loved finally encountering the dope fish. Which I'll probably talk about later when I talk about the series Enduring Legacy. And I beat episode five. And that's a summer that I will greatly remember. I remember, 
There are two things I think I remember about that summer. One was just because, like I said, I only had four weeks to enjoy the summer. So I really had to make the best of it. I spent all the hours I could awake and playing the game and playing these games on the computer because I just knew that once the school year started, I just wasn't going to have time to do it. And I knew that I had to make up for all the time that I missed. So I would stay, I would spend the summer playing games, catching up on all the news I missed reading uh, the back issues of Barry Smith's in t uh, Angst Technology comic, which I loved. Unfortunately, Barry has taken down that archive just right now, so I, I, unfortunately you can't read it right now, but um, I think he's going to have that archive back. He says he's going to have that archive back up. But uh, yeah, I, w I was reading uh, the Angst Technology web comic. And uh, yeah, that was that was my summer. That was a summer to that was at least a couple of weeks of the summer that, to enjoy for me. So let's talk a bit about the enduring legacy of Commander Keen. Just a couple of uh, postscripts to that. Um, right after, from what I had seen from uh, some of the information about Episode Six, I did eventually play Commander Keen Episode Six. It was eventually re-released online. So I was, I was eventually able to play Episode 6, and I enjoyed that also. But Episode 6, I always thought, had a very end, weird cliffhanger to it. It ended with a, uh, a look to a note of uh, basically involving Keen's arch nemesis from the first trilogy, coming back and saying that he is going to destroy the entire, basically in a coded message, that his plans are to take over the entire, gal you know, the entire universe or something. And he dares Commander Keen to stop him. And I, I know from what I had read in Masters of Doom that Tom Hall had planned to do a third Commander Keen trilogy in 3D. In fact, Tom Hall has admitted in interviews and things like that after the fact that his plans were to do it kind of like how Mario 64, like Commander Keen, think of think of Mario 64's gameplay and environment and stuff, but instead of Mario, he put Commander Keen in that type of environment with that type of gameplay, and you'd have what Tom Hall had in mind for that. And he says he was not planning on ripping off Mario 64. His plans were years before Mario 64 was released. So his intention was to do like a Mario 64 type Commander Keen years before Mario 64 came out, on the PC, but by that point, um, the other idea, the other people behind ID, decided no. They kind of wanted to take the company into a different direction. They wanted to make 3D action shooting type games, which appealed a lot to the other developers quite a bit, actually. Uh, particularly, Adrian Carmack preferred, you know, a bit more, you know, developing a bit more violence. Um, Carmack basically was the one who just decided, well, here's the technology that I want to make. Do your best with it. And they did. They did. They developed a game because they, they, they were big fans of the original Castle Wolfenstein game. They saw that the uh, copyright on it had lapsed. I think Silas Warner, if I remember correctly, was the guy that invented the original Castle Wolfenstein game. It was not an id software game. It was just a game that he developed himself. But the, but the, but the copyright had lapsed on it. And so they decided that they were going to make a Wolfenstein, basically a Wolfenstein game in 3D. And they released it for the personal computer through the shareware model. And from then on, basically, id Software would go on to do Doom, and then Quake, and then Quake 2, Quake 3 Arena, Doom 3, and, uh, you know, Rage. The, you know, the, the rest is history, basically, when it comes to the work of id Software. They never went back to continue with the Keen franchise, although... There were a couple of nods to Commander Keen, particularly I remember there is a Commander Keen uh, Easter egg in Doom 2, if I remember correctly, which a lot of people thought was basically a reference to the fact that Commander Keen was done. They weren't planning on making any more uh, com you know, Commander Keen games. Uh, although that was basically like just, it can be simply taken, I take it more as like just a fun little Easter egg and that's the end of it. There were a couple, like I said, there, there was a couple of enduring legacies after the Commander Keen series had ended, particularly the Dope Fish. The Dope Fish has kind of lived on in infamy as this was before even internet memes. Now, everybody talks about internet memes listing, lasting forever or something. I dare to tell you that the Dope Fish endured even beyond that. The Dope Fish was technically one of the internet's probably first memes. I mean... 
I mean, everybody kind of remembers things like, well, what, what began the smiley face or hello world or something, you know, things that just, you know, stuck around on the internet and was disseminated quite a bit. But the dope fish was just one of those things that just ended up in games left and right. In fact, I remember seeing the, you know, the dope fish and games like Anachronox or, uh, the, uh, Sin episode one, it was an Easter egg, or it was a, a lot of it was a big Easter egg. I actually really liked the Easter egg for Sin episode one because he was like one of those uh, secret, you know, you find him and stuff. But uh, yeah, there was the dope fish. There was oh god, what else was there? Um, it was in the original Max Payne game in a secret room. I think the dope fish appeared in Alan Wake, although don't quote me on that. I think he appeared in like the second floor of a bookstore when you're fighting your way through the t the, 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 the town at night. But uh, I think that's in Act Five or so. But uh, I can't I can't remember exactly if if that was him or if that was something else. But yeah, the the dope fish has lived on. The dope fish you might remember was one of the enemies from Episode Four, Commander King. He was, you know, he was graffiti. Like there has been dope fish graffiti in real life. That legacy just endured. I thought that was really awesome. There, there was the, for the longest time. I don't know if it's still available. A dope fish website maintained by I think it was uh, Joe Siegler. I think maintained that website for from uh, 3D Realms. But yeah, that that was a website which basically posted all the dope fish. There was even a essay, a very long essay actually, um, kind of done in the style. It was a, it was a fake. It was basically done as like a mockumentary or a fake true Hollywood story that was published on um, 3D Realms' website about like quote unquote a real Commander Keen. And what made it so exciting and interesting was um, just how uh, basically the guy had written it. As like a long form essay, kind of like the E True Hollywood story. I can't remember what its title was. It might still be on the old 3D Realms website, um, but it was basically about Commander Keen behind the blops or something, something like that. And it was done with both art and and words. And I remember reading it one day. It's a pretty long essay, but it's not it's not the longest essay I've ever read. I've ever read. And that was, to me, a good cap on the Commander Keen story, basically. This, let's call it fan fiction. I mean, that's really what it was. But this was a really good story that involved, um, basically said that Commander Keen was a real person, Billy Blaze. And he was a fan of id Software. And that id Software was planning on telling a game. And then they found a real Commander Keen, ba uh, basically. And they, they modeled the game after him. And he was so excited about being a part of the game series, and he became famous, the kid became famous, and then when they never released an episode 7 or, or, or a third trilogy for Commander Keen, he kind of had a bit of a falling out and, you know, turned to drugs, and <laughs> it was a, I mean, it was basically like every E! True Hollywood story story ever, basically, which is, <laughs> it's like, well, you, you know, he, was, he, he came from humble beginnings, and then... <laughs> And then he became famous overnight, and then he stayed famous for a while and stayed on top, and then the fame ended, you know. And after that, he turned to drugs and became a recluse <laughs> until the story, you know, until the story was written about him. Basically, every E. Tree from Hollywood story ever, or VH1 behind the music or something. I, I, I felt like that story, while it was obviously not it was obviously all authorized. It was just a fan story that uh, 3D Realms happened to have just simply published or self-published on their website or, or republished on their website with the guy's permission, of course. That to me was, I think, the good a good way to end the series. And I think that's a good way for me to end this podcast. Unfortunately, it seems like when it comes to Commander Keen, it's a bit of a gray area when it comes to rights. I think that the rights of Commander Keen are probably now owned by Bethesda. Because what probably happened was was that Commander Keen was ho was owned by id Software, but publishing rights for several of the episodes were owned by 3D Realms and then later Apogee. I'm sorry, Apogee and then later 3D Realms. But id Software still retained rights to the character, 
And I don't think anybody bought them. I don't think Apogee bought them. I don't think I don't think anybody bought them. And so what happened after that was essentially, you know, let's just face it, id Software is now owned by Bethesda, the, the publisher Bethesda. And so all id Software games and all id Software technology is wholly owned by Bethesda itself. If there is to be a Commander Keen sequel, and I think that there, there, there were a couple of plans. I, I remember reading a story a couple of years ago that there were plans to do a Commander Keen sequel. I don't think it was going to be done by id, but it was going to be done somebody with permission of id. With the, uh, it was going to still be a 2D, I don't, I don't remember if it was going to be a 2D game or a 3D game, but I remember probably somewhere around 2002 or so, they were planning on maybe doing a, a Commander Keen game using the Quake 3 Arena engine. I have no idea how that was going to happen, but obviously that never panned out, which was really unfortunate. There were a couple of uh, Commander Keen games done for the game. I'm sorry, for the Game Boy Advance, which were, as far as I know, simply just licensed titles. They were not done. They were done with permission of id Software, but uh, they were not done by id Software. And as far as I know, they were not ports. Of, they were like I, I had heard no, they were nothing special, which is really unfortunate. And um, I think I remember that John Romero at one point, when he had split off to do his own company called Monkey Stone back in the early to mid-2000s after the demise of Ion Storm, he, he and Tom Hall and Stevie Case kind of split off to do Monkey Stone, which only released, as far as I know, at least like one or two games. The one that I really liked, and I think I wish that they had re they decided to redistribute this, was of course the game Hyperspace Delivery Boy. I really wish... Uh, the, uh, John Romero or Tom Hall or somebody who used to work at Monkey Stone would either release it as, as freeware or release it through a digital distribution system like Steam or something because that game isn't being sold anymore. You can still find the demo for it online, but as far as I know, that game is simply just abandonware at this point. It would be interesting to see somebody uh, do something with it because I really would like to see Hyperspace Delivery Boy come back. That was very much, and there was a Dope Fish cameo in that game, and I think there was even a Commander Keen cameo in that game as well. But don't quote me on that second one because I never played the full version of it. It was never, it was just simply, if it was released, it was released for digital distribution, but it was only released for like the blink of an eye. So it was, I, by the time I had money to pick up a copy of it on PC, the Monkey Stone website is not even operational anymore. So and there's just no way for somebody to get it or to play it, which is unfortunate. I don't, I don't know. For me, I think that Commander Keen is fine the way it is. I think, I think we, had, we had six episodes, a, a side story. And even though the sixth episode ends with a cliffhanger, it's been so long. The original games are just so beloved. Like I said, they tried to make it, uh, you know, they tried to make some games for the GBA that never really, you know, they, from what I had heard, they were, they, they were nothing special. Let's, let's just leave it at that. Let, let's, let's, just, let's just leave it. That said, I think there's a market still for the original games. Uh, it would be cool to see them ported to like smartphones or something. I, don't, I remember id Software was really adamant about porting a lot of their early games like um, the Wolfenstein 3D to the iPhone way back in the day. But after Bethesda bought them, I don't think there's plans for that anymore, uh, to release any more games from id Software on the, on the iPhone or Android. But it'd be really cool to see Commander Keen on, you know, you know, release for like tablets or something. It would it'd be that'd be a good fit. Heck, I could easily see them being ported for. Well, obviously they're already available on Steam. You, could, if you really want to buy them, you can get them on Steam for a reasonable price. I heard. So, you know, go to it at that. But I don't think that there is going to be any further market for any further games. Maybe I'm wrong. I've been wrong about stuff like that in the past. But. Um, more often or not, that I'm usually right about my predictions when it comes to that sort of thing. And uh, I, I think that we're probably going to have just those episodes. I don't think there's going to be any more of them. If you really want to know what, you know, if you really need a closure on this, go looking up that essay, like I said, on 3D Realms' older website, the you know, Commander Keen story. Look that up and give it a read. It's not going to take you that long, probably about a half hour to an hour or so to read it. And... Uh, you know, that, that, that provided me closure, and I think that probably will provide you some closure if you read it for yourself. 
So, yeah, um, this podcast went a bit longer than I expected, but like I said, this is just, this was such a game that I love so much. It was my first major PC title. It was the, it was the game that made me, you know, stay to the PC. I, I stayed on the PC as a PC guy until 2007, pretty much, when it was, of all things, it was the publishers that made me leave the PC. I realized really quickly um, that by about 2007, when um, the publisher started putting all this online activation requirements and limited activations and all this other crap on their PC titles that were being sold at retail legitimately, um, there was no point, you know, I would have more rights simply playing the games on consoles and more uh, security in knowing that my games would continue functioning if I simply picked up the games on console versions. And that's what I that's what I stayed on. And I, st I pretty much stayed on the consoles from then on. And uh, I haven't looked back because, with very few exceptions, I haven't seen games really for the PC exclusively that made me want to leave, or, or at least go back to the PC. There are one or two. I mean, there are one or two. Quake Champions right now is looking very interesting. Well, well, I'll hold off on that one until I know more later on. But if there was anything that would bring me back to the PC, it would probably be the upcoming new Quake game from id Software and Bethesda. And that is the future for us right now. Um, obviously, id Software has just released Doom. I started playing it. It's a fantastic game. In fact, I'm recording this podcast right now simply because I can't play Doom multiplayer because the server's been shut down for maintenance, which is... <laughs> Which has made a good excuse. Oh, I'll probably. Oh, Doom is down. I can't play Doom multiplayer anymore until they patch this. Until they, until they're about to release a patch for it. So yeah, um, what am I gonna do? Ah, I'll finish that Commander Keen podcast. I was promising everybody. I can't wait for the. I I can't. I I I really have to give my love to Id and everybody who worked on this just fantastic game series, but. You know, time goes on, it's been a while, and, you know, we're going to move on. We're going to move on, and I'm fine with that at this point. Post a comment about what you feel. If you, if you have different opinions, that's fine. You know, post a comment about how you feel about what you think the future could be for Keen. But for me, I, I think it's over. So I want to thank everybody for listening um, to this podcast and its epically long conclusion. But... Uh, I don't know what the plans are going to be. We're going to keep doing podcasts for the time being, but I don't know exactly what we have planned for next time. So next time is coming, and I want to thank you all of you guys for listening. Until next time, guys, my name is Maniac with GameAccess.net. Take care, guys. Over and out.